All right. <clears throat> so we left off talking about enantiomers, diastereomers, talked about how to find configuration. <laughs> and I want to do uh, a couple of more configuration problems before uh, moving on to the, the next topic. All right. So let's go back up to here and let's see if we can. Let me see if I can just put pack, pack slowly in here again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll do this. All right, let's take uh let's take a couple of these. Uh stereo centers and see if we can figure out the configuration using what we know. We know that <clears throat> we first have to assign priority, and we also know that the groups are prioritized based on their atomic mass. We also know that if the groups are oriented in a clockwise or counterclockwise and see the RS. So let's see if we can we can do that. Let's start here. Let's do this one right here. Right? <laughs> so you look at that. Where are the four groups on that uh on that chiral center? And what is uh what group is on the dash already? Isn't the hydrogen already on the dash? Yeah, so we got a hydrogen going here. All right, so if that's already back, once we prioritize, what we see is what we get, right? We don't reverse it unless the hydrogen is going the opposite direction. So what group is the highest priority? We have a carbon right here. We got a carbonyl right here. We got a nitrogen. And we got a hydrogen. Those are my four groups. What are we comparing? Carbon, carbon, and what? Nitrogen. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So which one is the highest? Remember, priority <clears throat> is one to four. Where one is the highest. Or is the lowest. So, which one is is the highest? What do you think? The nitrogen. Good, excellent. That's one. We know that hydrogen is four. Only thing lower than hydrogen in priority is the lone pair. So that's four. Now we got to compare these two carbons, right? And you can see now immediately we got a problem. Right, because one of those carbons is branched, the other one is a carbonyl. Right, so let's look at it. <clears throat> if this carbon is bonded to another carbon, this carbon is bonded to oxygen. So that's really what we're comparing are those two points of difference. So this is carbon and that's oxygen. So which one is higher? What do you think? Oxygen. Oxygen, good. All right, so this is gonna be two and that's three. Now that's one is here, two is here, three is here. Is that clockwise or counterclockwise? It's counterclockwise, isn't it? Yeah, it's counterclockwise. Okay, so what's the configuration? If it's counterclockwise, it is S. S. Good. So this stereo center right here is S. Let's do another one. Let's do this one. Where are my four groups? Got 
that's one. Is that right? And you have a carbon right here. You have a carbonyl right here. And then if that group is on a wedge, by default, <laughs> the group, the other group on that carbon is on the dash. All right, and that's that's my other group. So when we compare, we know this is going to be four. Nitrogen is one because what we're comparing here and here are carbons. The one attached to oxygen would be two. Good. That's two and that's three. Yes. That clockwise, because H is already back. So we don't have to do anything. We'll have to do it, reverse it or anything like that. Is that clockwise? Counterclockwise. So we count to three. One, two, three. It's counterclockwise. So what is that uh, stereo center? R or S? S. S. Good. Now I know this seemed complicated, but if you look at a molecule like this, I mean it. It is a. It's not as hard as it looks, right? This is a very complex molecule, but we can go through and find. The configuration for all the stereo centers. All right, let's do um, let's do this one. All right, so we have a group here. We got a carbon, right? We got a carbon here. We got a carbon here. All right, this is one where you're going to have to. <clears throat> go and find a point of difference for each one, right? So uh, the carbon that's bonded to oxygen, the carbonyl carbon, compared to the other two carbons, right? The next atom in line here is carbon. The next atom in line here is carbon. The next atom in line here is oxygen, right? So this is gonna be one. There's a hydrogen going back that's not shown, that's gonna be four. Uh oh, sorry. All right? Now the, the question is what's two and what's three? <clears throat> so we got a choice between this carbon and this carbon. Wouldn't the one um, on like the left with the triple bond to nitrogen be two? I, I think I agree with that because well, it wouldn't be that one. It would be this one. <laughs> but it's this carbon that makes it two. Because if you look uh, at that carbon, let me see. And we're comparing that to this carbon. Well, no. So here we go. Carbon. And this is also carbon. But this carbon is bonded to nitrogen. And then this carbon right here is bonded to another carbon. So yes, that's two. And then that will make this carbon here by default three. Are y'all following that? Does that make sense? Right, what I'm comparing, let me erase all this other crap. What I'm comparing is this group to this group, this group, <laughs> excuse me. And because of that group right there, when I go to the next atom, it's carbon. When I go to the next atom here, this is carbon. Then when I go to the next atom, I have a nitrogen and a nitrogen. But the next atom here on this nitrogen is hydrogen. And then the next atom here is going to be carbon. So yes, this is going to be two. This is a, a, a unique case because you have to keep going until you find that point of difference. All right, so that'll be two, and then the bottom carbon is going to be three. So if I count that up, this is going like so, one, two, three. Is that right? Is that clockwise? That's also counterclockwise, isn't it? Or is that clockwise? Yeah, counterclockwise. It's counterclockwise. So this is also going to be S, right? And, and again, the, the reason why this is important is because 
somebody had to make this. Some team of scientists had to build this unless you can get it from uh, like a, as a metabolite. Sometimes you can grow different fungi and they'll produce these types of compounds as metabolites. But if not, you have to make it. So you have to figure out where to break this apart. How to if you're doing a convergent synthesis, you're gonna break it apart into pieces on paper and then figure out how to make each piece and fuse it together. But when you fuse it, all of your stereo centers have to be set. Right? That, I mean, that's just and you have to set them according to what this molecule is, otherwise, it's not gonna work for its intended purpose. Right, because those <clears throat> those stereo centers give it a shape. And when it, because it has a shape, it fits into whatever receptor it needs to fit into or it binds to whatever it needs to bind to properly. Without those stereo centers, it doesn't have the correct shape. All right, let's go to um, the handout. I, let me post it right quick uh, in the chat since we've got more people. This is my downloads folder, but I can find it right quick. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, yeah, so that that let's go to that handout and let's work through these few examples. Uh, let's work from one to one to three. All right, and then we're gonna I'm gonna introduce you to. Uh, how to do a reaction and set a chiral center in the process. And we're gonna introduce that. I think I've already sent the video for that, but I may not have, but I will. And then on Friday, we're gonna talk, that's gonna be our topic. <clears throat> but let's look at number one, it's, it just says draw the mirror image of each of the following compounds, right? So how would you draw the mirror image? of this and we're going to talk about this too this particular depiction right here is called a fisher projection right it's just basically a 2d uh version of a of a 3d molecule right and then when you do the fisher projections the horizontal Are wedged, the horizontal positions are wedged, and then the vertical positions are dashed. All right, but we're going to talk about that in a second when we talk about the configurations. <clears throat> so, what would the mirror image of that look like? What would you do? You'd start by drawing um, the bromine iodine on the left instead of the right of the, or you could start with the carbons. You create the carbon chain. You wanna do that? And then put the, yeah, exactly. And then put bromine iodine on the left, yeah. Okay. And then CO2H, all right. <clears throat> what about this one? Same thing, right? You take the image and you don't change anything. If you draw it this way, <clears throat> you don't change it. If you're gonna flip it over, then you gotta change everything. But if, you, if you're just drawing it like the mirror, you don't change anything. Are y'all following that? So I didn't change any of the stereo centers. But if, if I flipped it over, what would happen to those stereo centers? What would they look like? If I took the mirror image and flipped it over? Wouldn't the ones that's dashed become wedged and the wedged ones be dashed? Yes, everything would be reversed. And that's the, that's the key to understanding the mirror image is that it is the exact opposite of the original image, right? So... All right. Go ahead. I have a question. Oh, go right so, ahead. Uh, for going back with that one, mm -hmm. is the mirror image is just like 
flipping the two, but it's not changing the dashed or wedge. That's only if you like were to flip the mirror image over. Yeah. Itself. Yes. So if you were to take the mirror image and turn it over so that all the functional groups lined up, so mm -hmm. the OH, the OH, and the the uh, aldehyde would line up with the aldehyde like so, then you was, it would look like this. Right, so that would be chlorine, this would be OH, and this would be the aldehyde, All right? Then it would look like that. Okay. If you turned it over and lined it to line everything up. Okay. But if you so draw it like this question. with a mirror plane in between them, then it's just going to see itself, right? So mm -hmm. the chlorine is going to see that chlorine, so on and so forth. So I, I have a question also about that. Um, yeah, yeah. So... On the if we had this on the test, will it will it be a difference between the mirror and mm -hmm. image and the flip image? Like, would you say would you different? You know, if we, we were to draw the stuff, will it be um I'll draw this mirror image, but mm -hmm. uh, something else is different? You know, for the other one. Are you saying if you drew it this way, would that be wrong? Is that the question you asked? Uh, no, I'm sorry. Okay, so I guess I'm asking, will it be, if you were to ask us to draw, like, mm -hmm. the mirror image, will it be a difference between, like, knowing the mirror image, what that is, and knowing what the actual flipped version of the mirror image is? Like, would you ask, you know what I'm saying? If that, does that make sense? Yeah, no, because they're the same thing. Oh, okay. So this, the image I have circled, and this image are identical. They just rotated differently in space, that's all. Oh, so both answers are right? Yeah. They're both oh. correct. Okay, I think that's what that's that's hard for me to get. I guess. Yeah, yeah, it's but it's like again, if you put your hand in front of your face with your palm facing you, and then you flip it over so the back side of your hand is facing you, it's the same hand, right? It's just and it's just rotated around. So that's when when I draw when I say the mirror image or the <clears throat> or the flip image. That's what that means. I just took the the image that I drew on this side and rotated it in space. Dr. Russell, are you speaking? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I hit my mute button. I'm sorry. I was asking, can some would somebody like to annotate the screen and draw the mirror image of this next one? <clears throat> um what does everyone see what we annotate? Yeah, if you write on the screen. Everybody's gonna see it. Let me try. Can you see that? Yep. That's so weird. Mm, it is weird, huh? Sorry, this is big. That's okay. We're gonna make it work. Um, what is that? I can't see. This is what I can see right now. I'm sorry. Um, it's an OH group. Okay, so let's go. Okay. Is that H3? It's a CN, a, a carbon triple bonded to nitrogen. Okay. That's it. And then if you took that and you rotated it in space, those groups would, oh. would change, right? The uh, nitrile, you don't have to draw it like the rotated, the flip version, but if you rotated that around, the OH would then be on a 
wedge and then the carbonyl that's coming on the dash right there, it would be on a, uh, I'm sorry, the OH would end up on a dash and the carbonyl will end up on a wedge if you rotated it around, right? But you don't have to do that. That's good. All right, can somebody do the next one? We got, I mean, you can draw it down here if, if somebody wants to try this one. I can try it. Come on. Okay. Actually, you know what? I'm gonna I'm challenge you to just draw the opposite instead of using a mirror plane. Let's see what you got. Okay, how do I? So think about it. Remember, the mirror image, everything is reversed, yes? Yeah. So look, how many chiral centers do you have on that uh, ring? One, two. Got yeah, two. So reverse both of them, and that's the mirror image. Um, how do I draw on here? <laughs> you have to, uh, there's a little function up top uh, that says annotate. It's like a little pencil. Oh, okay. You see it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, geez, it's okay. That's okay. It's kind of clumsy unless you have a stylus or you can have a touch screen and can use your finger. Yeah. No, it's kind of clumsy. Oh, wait, I think I did that. Oh, my God. Oh my gosh, dude. I'm sorry. That's all right. So what? So is that a wedge? Yeah, it's supposed to be. Okay. All right. We'll take it. Okay, good. Good, <clears throat> we'll take that. So the mirror image of this will look like, uh oh. That, right? Yeah, wait, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll take it. If you gotta hit clear though, because it'll stay on the screen otherwise. I think you and Cecilia both have to hit clear. Oh, can you clear it or can you do? I got it. Yep. <laughs> All right. Let's go to the next one. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to tell me about these uh, stereo centers, the configuration, whether they're R or S. So let's start with this one. We'll do this one and then we'll come back to that one. And then we're going to do the Fisher projection last because there's some. A uh, little, a couple of rules that we have to know about Fisher projections before we can talk about how to find the configuration. But it was in the video that I sent, so it should be it should be foreign to you. All right, anybody going gonna help me with this one? Let's do the first stereo center first. Let's do this one. Uh -oh. Is that R or S? And what is what group is on the wedge on that carbon? You talking about the one furthest to the left? We're starting yep. from there. Yes, right here. Okay. Um, I got a question with this one. Go ahead. Since the hydrogen is on a wedge, wouldn't mm -hmm. that reverse the configuration? It would. Once we prioritize it, you're right. So let's prioritize the groups, and then let's figure out what's what. <laughs> so this is. Carbon, carbon, and carbon. What do we need to do to determine which carbon is higher in priority? 
move to the next next atom yes so this is a ch3 over here so the next atom there is hydrogen so that's going to be we know that this is four we need to figure out which one is one which one is two right this is going to be three because the next atom on that is hydrogen you look at the other two carbons the next atom is oxygen on both so the, both of those are higher than that one wouldn't the one with the double bond be two? Would it be two or would it be one? Oh, wait, one. Mm -hmm. So if you have a carbon with one bond to oxygen, two bonds to oxygen, or three bonds to oxygen, <clears throat> the number of bonds is how you prioritize it in this case. So, you, so on this carbon right here, that carbon has one bond to oxygen. And then over here, that carbon that you're comparing it to has two bonds to oxygen. So it's higher in priority. So this is going to be one. And then that'll be two. Following? Yes, no? Yes. That was this is um, and I know for when I, on my part one, I don't know, I don't think anybody waited a year to take the class, but when I talk part one, I don't know. I can't remember if we went over this. It's called the Con Ingo prelog rules, but I but it was in one of the videos that I sent out about how to determine priority. Um, but depending on what the atoms are, if you have a carbon with multiple bonds to a specific atom versus a carbon with one bond, then the carbon with the multiple bonds is going to have higher priority. Uh, I have a question. What's going on with the chlorine? Is there nothing? There's nothing. You said the chlorine? They don't, oh, we, yeah, we don't, they don't we, count? Nah, because remember, when you're looking at a, a chiral center, you're only looking at the, the atoms that are bonded to it immediately. All right, so all we care about is this carbon, this carbon, and that carbon, and then the hydrogen. Those are the four groups around it. The chlorine is too far away. And, and my first point of difference is oxygen in both cases. <clears throat> so I can prioritize if now if this, if this um, aldehyde was a hydroxyl, then I have to move to the next atom, but I don't have to do that. Is that clockwise or counterclockwise? This is one, two, three, what do you think? It's counterclockwise, but because the H is on the wedge, it's going to be clockwise. So it's going to make on, it R. Come on with the come on. You're right. So that's an R. That's that configuration is R. That's exactly right. All right. Let's do somebody do the next one. We know the H is on a wedge because the OH is on a dash. We know that. And mm -hmm. oxygen is higher, is higher, has a higher atomic mass than carbon. And that, those are my other groups, right? The groups around this chiral center are this carbon, this carbon, oxygen, and then hydrogen. So would the oxygen be one? Mm -hmm. Now you got two carbons on either side. So you have to look for a point of difference with those. With the one um, on like the left, that would be two? You mean, hold up. <clears throat> this one right here yeah okay so both of those are carbon when you go to the next atom here what is that the next atom that's bonded to uh this one what is that that's a carbon right yeah so you want you you want to go to oxygen, but we just need to go to the next atom. So this is a carbon and this is a chlorine. So the one on the right is going to have higher priority. If that makes sense. Because chlorine has a higher atomic mass than carbon. Yes or no? Yes, it does. All right. Okay. 
So that's that's going to make this carbon two, and then make this one over here three. All right, so now let's part, let's count to three. All right, so one is here, two is here, three. So that looks like it is what clockwise? Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, but the exception is hydrogen is forward. All right, it's not away from me. So if it's clockwise, it would normally be R, but because hydrogen is pointed forward. We're gonna we're gonna reverse it and say that is what. Yes. Yes. Good. So that's S. So the first one is R. Second one is S. What's the third one? I'm gonna be quiet. I'm gonna let y'all <clears throat> work on that one for about a minute. If somebody wants to annotate, go right ahead. I can. All right, come on. So, this one. Okay, good. And this carbon. Well, let me just first make the tell you all this is a CH3. That's a, yeah, the end of every line is a CH3, yes. And then this carbon, they're both carbons, but this one is attached to an oxygen, which has. Pretty sure, yeah, that should have a higher oxygen or a higher mass. Yeah. So then this would be number two. Yes, good. This is three, and since four is already on a dash, and that's clockwise, and that's going to be R. Good, excellent. Put your um, put your uh, cash out in the chat. Oh, thanks. For lunch. That's good. That. that that tells me a lot about whether or not you caught this and you caught it. So that's good. We said this one is R, right? Excellent. Yes. Any questions about anything? <clears throat> All right, let's do the next one. Now this I'm, I'm going to assign <laughs> for you to do outside of class to draw all of them. How many stereo isomers are you going to get from this molecule? Uh, Asia, I need yours too because I forgot to send yours yesterday on Monday. So, okay, so do I put it in a chat again yeah. or just? Yeah, just put it in the chat. It's fine. All right. How many how many stereo isomers should I get? What's the formula that what's the formula I use for that? It'll be two to the n, and because you got three, it'll be eight possible. Okay. Good. 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 So I got three three chiral centers. So that's two to the third. So that's eight possible stereo isomers. <clears throat> All right, so I need you to finish that part. I don't want to put you in a breakout room because then everybody will be asleep and we don't want to do that. But I need you to finish that part. So draw all of those. So when you turn this in uh, on the day after the test or whatever, what did I say? Day after the exam, day before the exam, whenever, that needs to be completed. I'm just going to write this as on your own. All right. Now I need to introduce you to another topic, which is how stereochemistry can be uh, induced in a reaction. So I'm gonna add a page right here. Uh, today is the, man, it's the 31st, good Lord. I know, time goes by really fast. Mm -hmm. Are y'all going to the game Sunday? Let me ask that. No. 
No. Okay. I'm going because we off Monday. I'm going to take advantage of that. <clears throat> All right. So this is a different topic. And we're going to talk about stereochemistry and reactions. So let's say, again, we're, we're trying to make Paxlovid or some other molecule, <clears throat> and we need uh, we need a chiral center to be set, right? There's two ways to do that, two ways to do it. All right, that the one the one way which is probably most often used is to do what's called asymmetric catalysis. This is what I did for my graduate work or some of my graduate work. All right. So you'll take a catalyst, uh, some type of transition metal catalyst, and what you would do <clears throat> is attach a ligand to it with some chirality in it. So I'm, I'm gonna just write this out. So let's say I have a chromium catalyst and I, I attach to it a, what we call a box ligand. Don't worry about, I, this will be in the notes, so don't worry about trying to write it right now. All right, so this is what we, this is a bis oxazoline ligand, it's called a box ligand. <laughs> and I'm attaching that to chromium, right? All up because nitrogen has long pairs. So we can, what we call chelate, we can donate those electrons towards chromium. And what this does is it creates a pocket around chromium. So any, so then whatever your substrate is, let's say you're doing a, um, a reduction. So you got this carbonyl that's that's here, something like that, and you adding in a hydrogen. Actually, no. Let's add in something bigger. Let's add in um, a methyl group. I'm I'm trying to simplify this so that I don't get too deep in the weeds, right? When that methyl group adds. To the carbonyl is going to have to come from a side that's open, right? Because if you look here, you got a, a group here mm -hmm. and you got a group here, and those groups are going to create asymmetry. So they're going to basically create a pocket around that uh, carbonyl. So then this group is going to come in from the, the path that's easy, easier to access. So let's just say for the sake of argument that it comes in from this side. So it's going to come in from here. Right? Because that methyl group is pointed back. And so that the, the group that's coming in can get around that. So if that happens, then my product is going to look like this, and I will have set a chiral center. So it's going to be R. Let's just say this is going back. Mm -hmm. CH3, and then the CH3 here. So let's say that. Let me change that, because that's actually not chiral. That's not. Nah. Because that would have that wouldn't have four groups around it. Right? So if you do asymmetric catalysis, the, the goal is to create a pocket around the reactive site and then force whatever nucleophile or whatever you're adding in to come from a specific direction. Right. You want to what this does, what the 
ligand does it, is it creates a pocket and it creates a bias. So a bias in the transition state. How many of you remember that term from part from organic one? Transition state. Can somebody tell me what that what that word or phrase means? The term. Um, it's the. Hmm. So it usually refers to like a certain conditions, which. Um, it's in between phases, so like. Okay, so yeah. so if we start at the reactants. Right, so let me let me just show you here. Right, so we have a, this is our uh, substrate. So that's our chromium, coordinated with the carbonyl with the ligand around it, right? And then so one of these pathways is going to be lower in energy than the other. That's how you get the the uh, bias, right? So let's say for the sake of argument that the one we have drawn up here, right, this pathway where it's coming from this side is favored. Right, so the act the activation energy is going to be lower. Right. And then if let's say if it comes from the other side, if it comes from the other side, right, and it's encountering this. And let's say for that, that's going to be that's going to have a higher activation energy. But the top, if you look at the energy diagram, the peak right here, that's the transition state. And then on the other side, let me change that right quick. Come on, Russell. All right. <clears throat> so one, this is also going to give you a product. Right, so what that what that ligand does is, is it creates this bias and, and one of those transition states is gonna be higher in energy than the other. And because of that, you get favoritism, right? You get what's called selectivity. So this product would be from the red route. And then the other product where the, the um, group is coming from the other side, it will give you this. Let me just write that out right quick. Right, this would be from the blue route. All right, but it, it, the point I'm trying to make is that this is one way to set chiral centers. You have a chiral catalyst, and then whatever reaction you're doing, you do it in the presence of that catalyst. You generate some type of bias in the transition state, and you get selectivity, right? You get one of those products being favored over the other, right? So this is, we'll say that this is the favorite product because the path to get to it is lower in energy. All right, so on this side it has, and this is the activation energy. You should remember that from part one also. So that's delta G double dagger, same thing here. This is the activation energy for this side. And the, the uh, again, the, the pathway that's depicted in red is lower in energy. So lower activation energy means that it's gonna have a higher rate and it's gonna be favored. Right, so that's one way to, to make chiral molecules is to use asymmetric catalysis. It's probably the most popular and the, the, the most facile way to do it too. 
the other way, and I got two minutes to, to talk about this, but the other way to make chiral molecules is to react something chiral with something achiral. So this would be the second method. First method is asymmetric catalysis. The second way is to use a pre-existing stereo center. Right, so if I start with a molecule that already has a chiral center in it, and I wanted to do a reaction on a, some car, some functional group that's there, right? This pre-existing chiral center is going to dictate the outcome. It's going to dictate like which pathway is lower in energy, which way is more accessible, so on and so forth. So I'll take this, and then let's say I want to react it with, I'll use the same nucleophile. Right, the fact that this is on a wedge is going to block the top face. So this is going to block one face. Right, so let's say just for the sake of argument that this is the product. Where the CH3 comes in opposite of the of the pre-existing group. So that's going to attack the opposite side. All right. So <laughs> that's going to create a bias because of that pre-existing stereo center. So this is gonna block one side, cause the other side to be more accessible. And then that's what's gonna cause the selectivity, right? It's going, that's what's gonna make one isomer favored over the other, right? So this is, a, this is the second way. We're gonna talk more about this on Friday, uh, but this is a way to, to also make chiral molecules because the, the, the um, The idea is that if you take something chiral plus something that's not chiral or achiral, then you're going to get a mixture of stereoisomers. All right, we'll, we'll pick this up on Friday. I have a video for this that I'll send out, and then we're going to walk through these. Uh, there's a couple of questions we're going to walk through on Friday. All right, questions. Any questions about anything?